two parts of God's character are taught by this that seem sometimes opposed to each other to us. One that seems rather easy to learn and that we tend to like to talk about and one that is more difficult. But both of these lessons were absolutely vital and are vital for us today, just as we see in the story with Abraham and Sarah. This is God's inerrant and inspired word. Please read along with me. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran to the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servants. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after you may pass on since you have come to your servants. So they said, do as you said. And Abraham went quickly to the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three sias of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they sat and ate. They said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the door of the tent. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. Then the men set out from there, and they looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed by him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he promised him. Then the Lord said, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry <clears throat> that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abram drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you sweep away the place and not spare it for 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose 50, suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him and said, suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not destroy it. 
Then he said, Oh, let the Lord not be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let the Lord not be angry, and I will speak again. But this once, suppose ten are found there. And he answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went away when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. God wanted to teach his servants more about his character. And the character that he required for the people who followed him and who were a part of the covenant community that he was building. He wanted to mature their knowledge and appreciation of him and his ways so that Abraham would teach it and pass it on as the founder of this nation that God was going to form, protecting this nation from the things that could destroy it, protecting this nation that he was building from the things that were destroying Sodom and Gomorrah that he just looked out and saw. Both of these scenes took place in one encounter with God. They are intended to go together to make the larger point, preparing them for what was to come. They are two sides of the same coin meant to be taken together, meant to be the type of thing that Abraham would have gone back and just thought about and thought about and put those two lessons together. If Abraham and Sarah did not hold them in balance with each other, they could have come to wrong conclusions about God and his character. And the same education and reminder is needed today with all of us. In scene one, God opens coming to visit Abraham once again. But this time, he is really coming to visit Sarah. Verses one through two give us the circumstances. And the focus of the first scene here is on Sarah, where the second is more on Abraham. We read, The Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes, and he looked, and behold, there are three people that are standing there. So this took place where Abraham was living, where he had pitched his tent, and where he had called home ever since he had really come and settled there. He is by the Oaks of Mamre, as you may remember from past references in chapters 12 through 14. This is located about 19 miles southwest of Jerusalem in Hebron, and there is about an elevation of about 3,000 feet here. So he is up high, and he can look out over Sodom and Gomorrah, and that relates to the next scene. He lived near a well-known grove of oak trees. And he lived by three friends. Three men had become his friends, and as you will remember, they had formed a pact with him, even risking their own lives in order to go to battle with him. And so these are the three men that helped to rescue Lot, as we saw back in chapter 14. And then at the end of that chapter, we see that these three brothers are friends of Abraham, and they are the ones that receive something after that. He says, Abraham said, I will take nothing but what the young man have eaten and the share that would go to them. And so he lists them, the three of them. Abraham was sitting at the door of his tent in shade during the hottest part of the day. And this was common as it is today in many cultures to take like a siesta in the middle of the day. And as we read that the three men stopped at his front door, but these are not three ordinary men. These were heavenly visitors they were the Lord and two angels. The first person was God himself, what theologians often refer to as a theophany or a visible manifestation of God himself, or a Christophany, the pre-incarnate Christ. And this is also, as we've seen in the past, the angel of the Lord in other places in the Bible. We know this because verse 1 tells us that the Lord appeared to him. The Hebrew word that Moses used here is the word Yahweh, which is only used of God in the Bible. Then we see the word Lord is used 13 more times in verses 10 through 33. Further, we know that this is the pre-incarnate Christ from his knowledge and his actions and from how Abraham responds to him. 
We know the identity of the other two men because verse 22 tells us in the second scene that these two men parted ways with God and Abraham and they walked on to Sodom. And then in the next chapter in verse 1, we see that they are called angels. The two angels came to Sodom that evening. So they walk out from them and then they get to the city that evening. Abraham immediately knew that this was a heavenly group. Aside from calling the leader Lord in verse 3, using the term Adonai, a title also used for God, Abraham is there conveying that he is his servant, that he is beneath him, that he realizes how high and lofty the Lord is. He's not calling him Lord in the way that we might say he was just a property owner or someone who is over him like a boss. He is referring to him in a way that is high and above him. This is also shown by Abraham's actions. First, as soon as he saw them, he rushed to meet them, and it says he bowed down all the way to the ground. This is an extreme form of what they would have done in their culture. It shows that he realizes this is a different person. We also see it had a sense of urgency and need and desire to spend time with them and to find out why they had come, to hear what God was coming to tell him. Finding favor also is important. This was an expression that would have expressed someone of higher rank as well. And so bowing down to the earth, finding favor, using this name for him, all builds the case. These are a sign of reverence that Abraham had that he would not have given to just any normal travelers who were passing by his front door. Second, he responded with extreme hospitality, going well beyond the normal ancient Near Eastern cultural norms and, and what would have been expected. Now, that doesn't immediately jump off the pages at us. When we read in verse 4 through 5, in fact, it sounds quite the opposite. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourself while I bring a morsel of bread. To me, when I first read that, it almost sounds like, well, I'm bringing you one little piece of bread. It doesn't sound very lavish, but it is. Things were not as they sounded. You see, what he is doing is he is intentionally toning things down, knowing what he really had planned in his mind. This was inviting someone for over for dinner and saying, oh, it won't be that much, but we'll just have a good time together, so why don't you come on over anyway? And really, in the back of their mind, they're planning something quite lavish, and they say, maybe, well, we'll just have pasta. We'll just throw together something e easy. But then when you arrive, you find out, yes, it's pasta, but it's homemade ravioli with lobster and capers and sage and garlic, and it's sides of green beans wrapped in bacon. And it's fresh zucchini salad that they just got out of their garden. And it's cheddar-filled biscuits served with a light chardonnay. And you wonder, what were they thinking this all along? You see, this is what is going on. He is purposely downplaying his hospitality. He knows exactly what he is going to do. This is humble, but it is genuine. And he is trying to communicate that you are so high above me that there is nothing that I can give, no matter how lavish it is, that will ever say thank you enough for coming and spending time with me. So he is toning it down. But we see immediately he gets up and he springs into gear and he gets his wife and servants involved. And remember the size of army just from his servants that he had to go rescue Lot. So there are probably many people behind the scenes going to work for him. And he takes three sias of fine flour. This is about the equivalent, a sia is about the equivalent of two gallons. So this is about six gallons of fine flour. This is very expensive flour. He is pulling out the best. And then he chose his best calf, the most tender, the most flavorful veal that he could give, along with milk and soft cheese. And if you've ever had the ability to spend time in Wisconsin in particular, but Vermont also, and you travel past dairy farms, you know that the soft cheese curds that they make fresh every single day are just absolutely phenomenal. This was a royal banquet filled with rich and expensive food. This was not the way that people ate every single day. And then we see he did not sit down and eat with them. Instead, this little fact that we can almost pass by, he stands and serves them. He doesn't even eat with them. He wants to make sure that everything is perfect for them for the whole meal. 
Though Abraham was wealthy and hospitable, this is not the way he would have treated every traveler who passed by his door. And so we see that these are special travelers. He has a genuine interest in doing whatever they need to express his reverence for them. And we must stop and ask ourselves, when was the last time we had this attitude with God ourselves? When was the last time we had a sense of urgency to sit at his feet, to open up his word, to let the Holy Spirit speak to us, and not just to learn knowledge. That's wonderful. Doctrine is so important but to let that doctrine take us to the person of Christ to transform us and make us more like him. Because if we just love doctrine for the sake of doctrine, we usually end up being gnarled and twisted. We end up being harsh and critical in the areas that we think we know something and someone else doesn't. But when was the last time you wanted to sit at the feet of your Lord and Savior and let him do work in your heart? and make you more like him? When was the last time you stood by and hung on his every word, listening to every single comment in that meal, as it were, as you opened the pages of the scripture? When was the last time you could not wait to serve him, even sacrificially, as we see Abraham doing here, and you didn't complain about the interruption in your day or the time that it was taking or look at your watch, but you were just happy not only to serve the person maybe you were serving, but to do that for Jesus, knowing he was pleased. When was the last time you were thrilled to come to church and to worship and to soak up what God would have for you? We show how much we actually believe the gospel by things like this. This is not meant to make us feel guilty, but to do honest self-inventory and see that the Savior that we worship is just as worthy. In verses 9 through 15, in a nod to Southern culture, we learn that they sat down, they ate their whole meal, they took their time before they even brought up the reason for why they were there. You can talk for an hour to someone in the South who grew up in the South, and then 30 seconds before they leave, I'm finding out that they'll tell you why they actually came for the visit. <laughs> And I think that's what's going on here. And so he asked, where is Sarah, your wife? And Abraham responded, she is in the tent. And this is really the point of the first lesson. And so this gets Sarah's ears perked up. This is the first lesson. They come for Sarah. They ask where she is because she can hear through the tent. And that would have immediately drawn her attention to what they were going to say. She knew they were talking about her. Abraham and Sarah were one, and God's plan with Abraham involved Sarah. It had to. And God knew that Sarah believed in God, that Sarah loved God, that she believed in his gospel promise as well. The text does not say it, but we know Abraham told her that she was going to have a baby, and she did not believe it at this point. That is not the type of thing, of course, that you would forget to t tell your spouse. But even more than that, we can build the case and we can say we know this because she was feisty. We've seen that already. And that's wonderful. And she would have asked her husband why he was suddenly referring to her by a different name and why he suddenly wanted to be called a different name after 99 years. But she would have definitely come and said, okay, Abraham, what is this about circumcision? Why are you doing this? And so, of course, he would have told her, this is why I'm doing this. This is what it represents. God had me do this because of what he just told me. You are going to have a baby. They came for Sarah because she was a very important part of God's plan. And despite hearing what God said through her husband, she still did not believe. She still had a hard time taking her faith in the God who created the universe and applying that to her and knowing that God could create life in her yet again. So they got her attention, and then they repeated what had been told, I'm sure, by Abraham. I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. They give a specific prophecy with specific detail. Even after all of that, Sarah still responded in the way that Abraham did initially. Verse 12 tells us she laughed with an incredulous laugh, not only a laugh of, this is kind of funny, and I'm sure she had a little bit of that too, but doubt. 
She basically thought God worked, and she believed in God working, but that he worked through normal means. She had become comfortable with the false idea that Ishmael was supposed to be the son of the promise instead of her having a baby, instead of trusting God to be able to work outside of the normal box. So even when she heard the Lord speak, she still thought, this is impossible. The difference between her laugh and her husband days before, though, is important. Her laugh was silent. It was quiet. It was internal in her heart. Nobody heard it. But God was getting ready to teach her something through that point. That he is the God of the impossible. The God who is able to do anything because he could see into her heart and know what no one else could see. So if he could do that, he could do what he just said. The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? This is actually merciful. It may have been a little uncomfortable, but it is mercy. This was spoken for the benefit of both of them. It let them both know God knew what was inside of them. God knew that Abraham had laughed, but now he trusted. And God knew that she had laughed and still was having a hard time. And that let them know that he is the God who is able to do things that are impossible for people, but nothing is impossible for God. We cannot read a person's mind or heart, but <clears throat> he is able to do that. And so he backs that up with this rhetorical question. He gave the illustration and then the specific teaching. That should have caused Sarah to fall down in worship and to confess her doubts to trust in him and wonder and in awe, to begin contemplating this truth that she was going to have a baby, but instead she is fearful now. And she runs away from God by telling a lie. She tries to cover up her sin instead of going to the one who can deal with her sin, failing to think since God could see inside of her when she laughed, he could definitely see inside of her now when she is lying as well. But just like our Lord, he did not leave her there. In his mercy, he gave her a rebuke of restoration. And that is always what repentance is supposed to do. To cause us to see ourselves honestly and to draw us back to God, the one who can deal with it. He confronted her with the truth in order to move her closer to him. And in Hebrews 11, 11, we learn that this is exactly what happened. It says, by faith... Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age. She considered him faithful who had promised. We see she came to the place where she did believe. She did end up rejoicing when she had this baby. By this, she learned more than God's ability to do miracles in the physical realm. She learned he is able to do anything in order to move his plan of salvation forward. And that is the key this morning toward his greatest work of saving sinners like Abraham and Sarah and saving sinners like each and every one of us. She learned the reason why God was going to give her this baby in the first place. She learned that he is merciful and gracious and will forgive those who trust in him and his gospel plan, that great promise given all the way back in the garden that God would send a Messiah. But that was not all they needed to learn. That was the easy lesson. They needed to learn and pass on more than this. They needed to learn that the God who sees inside of every one of us is also holy and just and must deal with our sin in one of two ways. And that lesson was taught right after dinner. The Lord and the two angels got up to leave, and as a good host, Abraham walked out with them to say goodbye to them, to point them in the right direction where they were going. Verse 16 tells us the two angels looked down towards Sodom and the tone of everything changes. And we are getting ready to read four stories after this that are really hard and tragic stories. And the tone changes right here. Verse 16 tells us they looked down where they were going to go. And from 3,000 feet elevation, they could see out over this valley and over this area. 
And at that point, the Lord asked another rhetorical question, this time meant to grab Abraham's attention and to let him know the second but hard lesson, the reason why they came. In verses 17 through 19, he said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? And he goes on to explain why. Because he is making him the founding father of this nation, and he is going to represent a lot of people. And this lesson is something that not only did he need to learn it, but he needed to pass it on to everyone. Or this nation that was getting ready to be formed would become like the nation they were looking over, the city-state that they were looking over. Abraham needed to learn to be the kind of leader himself that this lesson teaches as he waited for the promised Messiah. The Lord had Abraham's attention after asking this question as they looked out over Sodom. He knew what Sodom was like. The Lord said to Abraham, because of the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, it is very great. Their sin is very grave. I will go down and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry. He is telling him here that he hears the prayers of people and he cares, especially when people are being mistreated. And he was telling him, though he is the God who just read Sarah's mind and the God who knows all things, he is omniscient and omnipresent that he is a God of justice. He is just telling him in a way that he could understand. He is telling him he is a God of justice who does not act like we do, who have passions that just suddenly flare up and we have a knee-jerk reaction to something. No, he is the opposite. He is like the careful investigator who gathers all of the facts and acts solely based upon the truth after having all of those facts. Now, this is a metaphor. It's told for him. Of course, he knows all the facts at all time. He always does. But he is communicating to Abraham something about his character and also telling him the judgment that is getting ready to come is justified. And he is telling him, this is the type of leader you will need to be and that you will need to pass on to your children and that they will need to be as well. He had to be both a man of faith and righteousness in one. He had to be a man who had faith and loved God and realized he was nothing but dust and ashes, but he also had to realize that he needed the Messiah who was to come and that God is holy. At this point, the two angels left. They parted ways with the Lord and Abraham, and they headed out toward the city where his nephew Lot and his family, Lot's family, lived. The two angels were going to carry out the role of the two witnesses, as it were, that we see later on under the Mosaic Law. Before God said any capital punishment could be carried out for a capital crime, you had to have two witnesses. And so that is the role of these two angels. And Abraham understood this. His mood immediately changed, and he began to wrestle with things. And you see his heart of compassion. You see something that is wonderful inside of him. Not only because he loved his nephew and his nephew's family, and he didn't want them to be swept away, but because of the underlying questions that he had, he struggles. And he's trying to put two and two together. I see things that are wonderful about you, God, but this is hard, and how do I put these two things together? Questions like, is God really just in all of his judgments? Will everyone who trusts in him and his promise to send the Messiah really be saved? Because if these people could be judged, I realize my sin, and we've been reading about the roller coaster ride of his life and his sin as well. Am I really safe? Will I really eventually be saved? Is he holy and also merciful? Is he holy and able to destroy a whole city? What if there is even one person who is righteous there? Is anyone truly secure? Or will someone be swept away that should not be swept away? And you have to remember, we have the whole Bible. Abraham at this point did not have any of it. This is right at the beginning. How can the God of the universe who hates sin be just and at the same time uphold his promise of mercy? And he struggled with this. 
It is a question that many people face, especially on their deathbed. But here, Abraham faced it and contemplated this as he thought about the death of others. He went to God with humble recognition that he was but dust and ashes. But he also went in faith, in faith in God's goodness and his mercy, what he already saw of him as he wrestled. In verse 25, Abraham asked, Will God, the judge of the universe, over everyone, always do what is right? And he needs to know this. Is there ever a time when you will sweep away even one of those who trust in you, along with the rest of those in that city that hate you? He began by asking, would God save the city for 50 people? Thinking surely Lot had influenced other people that were there. There must be at least 50 people in that city who are still believing in God or trusting in God, not living like the rest of the city. But then as he begins to wrestle with it, he knows the city, he knows the reputation, and he thinks, oh, maybe that's a little too big of a number. God, how about a smaller number and a smaller number until he got down to 10, wanting to know at least his nephew and his nephew's family and maybe their in-laws would be included in this? God answered him with a similar answer to the parable of the wheat and the tares that Jesus told so many years later. A parable that gives all of us comfort who know the Lord. With the answer that settled his heart and with the answer that can settle our hearts, he would not destroy the city if there were ten righteous people in it who believed in God and his promise, who were counted righteous through their faith, just as Romans 4 tells us. Through this encounter we learn the God who sees everything from whole cities down to each individual's hearts and thoughts is right in his assessment with every one of us. He never makes mistakes. He knows absolutely everything you think and I think, everything we've ever said, everything we've ever done. He knows our intentions and motives behind it. And that means that he will eventually judge all sin and bring it to an end. And that should give us pause. It should cause us to think about many different things. It should give us pause as we look out over the world, as we look out over the city as it were in our life that we live in and all the people that are perishing. We don't know how much time we have. It should give us pause. It should give us a sense that we pray for them and want them to come to know Christ. But that is not really the focus of this verse. It should also cause us to rejoice and to know that God will someday end all sin. Evil will come to an end. It will be judged, and we can rejoice in that. We will no longer struggle with sin and temptation. But it should cause us to look out and to have that, but also look within and to realize that he is a God of justice and a God of mercy and that we are truly secure in him. And when he promises something to us, we can rest in that 100%. His justice means those who place their trust in God and his promise of rescue do not have to fear that coming judgment at all because he is merciful he is the God who is able to see the obstacles of Sarah's heart and Abraham's heart, but to overcome those obstacles. And for anyone who trusts in him and his righteousness and his promise, he is able to do that for you as well. You see, Jesus, the ultimate promised son of Abraham, came through the incarnation lived the perfect life, and then went to the cross for us. He took the judgment that Abraham and Sarah deserved. He took the judgment that each and every one of us sitting here this morning deserve. He was our substitute, and that enabled him to remove our sin from us so that it is impossible for him to pour out his wrath on us since it was already poured out on someone else. So how do we blend these two things together of God's mercy and his holiness? It's because his holiness 
and his hatred for your sin and my sin has already been poured out on someone. So now we can rest in his justice knowing that it would be completely unjust for him to pour that out on us. So we do not have to fear his justice, but we can love his justice as we love his mercy as well. God simply cannot break his promise to even one person. And that is why he would have rescued even one person out of the city. But we see that Abraham stopped with 10. He got the point. God can simply never break his promise to you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you may struggle with right now, We've read some pretty awful things that Abraham already did. God did not break his promise to him, and he will not break it to you. So his holiness and justice actually became a comfort to Abraham in this lesson. It is profound. And his holiness and his justice, along with his mercy and grace, can become that for us causing us to run to the Lord daily with the same eagerness to hear his word and to be taught by him and to let him transform us, to not hide our sin from him, but to pour it out to him in faith and repentance, knowing he will change us, just as he did with Abraham and Sarah, knowing that he can overcome every obstacle in our life to make us more like his son, and knowing that we will find that we can rest in what he promised just as much. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you're amazing. You are absolutely amazing. And we ask that you would help us to fall more in love with you and to run to you daily. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.